Welcome to In Focus. I'm your host, Dolores Alvarez. Today we have Dr. Robert Isad, a professor of music and director of choral studies in the music department right here at Cal State Fullerton. Dr. Isad also works as the artistic director of the Pacific Choral, a music program based in the OC that performs at the Sager Sturm Center for the Arts. At the 64th Grammy Awards, Dr. Isad became a Grammy Award winning musician for the recording of Mahler Symphony 8, Symphony of a Thousand, in the category of Best Choral Performance. Without further ado, Dr. Eistad, welcome to the show. Thank you very much, Dolores. I'm really happy to be here with you. Perfect. Can you tell me a little bit about yourself? What made you get into teaching? Well, I think that I've always had the heart of a teacher. Um, I just never realized um, that I could sort of wed my passion of being a musician and being a teacher together when I went to college. I went to college as a um, pre-medicine major and uh, with a piano scholarship, and uh, was forced to sing in a choir, fell in love with it. This is a really fast story, you know, right? Fell in love with it, and, um, and then realized that I really wanted to communicate and share my love and passion for music, and specifically singing choral music with other people. And I really love um, working with college students and with graduate students. And so I decided to sort of focus on, on building my career in that direction. Mm -hmm. Um, and I never imagined I would be a professional conductor as well. I thought I would, you know, and I, I, I really didn't know what was available to me at that time in my life, and I didn't realize that I could maybe do both, that I could work with students and I could also work with professionals at the same time. And so, so that's my life. That's what I, that's what I get to do. <laughs> perfect, perfect. And I know in 2016, uh, you were actually recognized by the campus as Outstanding Professor of the Year for your passion and dedication to music. Now, do you believe being a professor here at Cal State Fullerton has made you a better conductor? Oh yeah, for sure. I mean, it's made me a better person, <laughs> first of all, but also a, a better musician and conductor. Um, you know, the, I started working here in 2006, and I was, I was very young, and I didn't have a lot of college teaching experience. And so I was really mentored by not only my colleagues in the School of Music and Theater and in Dance, but also by the students you know, um, working with them to learn how to be a better conductor and a better educator, I think, was one of the most pivotal things in my life. And um, Cal State Fullerton is a really special, special place. I, I love this school. I love the mission of this school. Um, I feel like when I'm working here, not only am I standing side by side with some of my best friends um, in, in the School of Music, but also um, I feel like I'm making a difference in, in people's lives. The student body here at Fullerton, I, I think you would probably agree with me, is um, really special. Yes. They're passionate. Um, they are hungry, hungry for, uh, for opportunities. And they are so hardworking and very, very talented. And, um, and giving our students professional opportunities in music, I think, is one of the best things about this job that I have. So yeah, being at Cal State Fullerton and, and working side by side with my colleagues and the students cultivated a new sense of artistry. When I realized that the only limit that the student would have in their life is a limit that I would superimpose on them, it changed my whole life. When I realized that if I pushed them to be the best they could be, beyond what they even thought, they would go beyond my wildest dreams. And so we, I've had some amazing artistic experiences with the students here at Fullerton, and, um, and I'm grateful every day to be a member of our faculty. That's wonderful. That's amazing. And can you tell me a little more, what kind of choral classes do you teach? So I teach, uh, I conduct the University Singers, which is our small mixed ensemble. That means we have sopranos, altos, tenors, and basses, high to low in the group. It's our top ensemble. So it's our starting lineup in the School of Music. Uh, it's 32 voices. Mostly by the time they come into that choir, they are um, seniors or senior status or graduate students. Um, I also teach beginning conducting. So um, all of the students in the School of Music have to take a conducting class. If you're an instrumental person, you take instrumental conducting. And if you're somebody that really dreams about um, singing, either professionally as an opera singer or a jazz singer, or even uh, teaching in the schools, you would take my beginning conducting class. So I teach that class. I also teach a graduate um, seminar in advanced choral conducting. And that's for my, the students. I have a studio of six to eight um, graduate students that study instrumental and choral conducting with me. And so I teach that class. And I also teach private conducting lessons to the graduate students. 
and I teach a class, two classes in literature. So I teach um, a class in choral literature from the medieval period through like the Baroque era, like 1750. And then I teach another class that basically starts there, like 1750, 1800, all the way to today. Wow. Wow, that's a lot. It's a lot. I know. <laughs> yeah, we so teach intense. a lot in the School of Music. Yeah, Some of my other yeah. colleagues say, wow, how many classes do you have? <laughs> it's, it's all okay. Perfect. And can you tell me a little more, how did you become interested in music? Did it start from an early age? Yeah, I think we were talking before before the show today, and <laughs> um, and I told you that when I was five years old, I asked to play the piano. And my family was not very wealthy, and um, my parents really wanted me to have that opportunity. And so they saved their money and they bought this little old piano. It's called a spinet piano. It's this little upright piano. And they paid um, as much as they could so I could take some piano lessons from this wonderful uh, woman down the street from, from my parents' home. And it, they started driving me there, and then I started riding my bicycle there. And I loved it. I loved playing the piano. And um, I, was, I think I was one of the only kids. My mom used to laugh, and she'd say, like, go outside and play baseball, because I'd want to sit inside and play the piano. I just I really enjoyed it, but I also liked the challenge of, of getting better and pushing myself. So that's how it started. And I had parents that really supported me. And in my school, I played in the band. Um, I also played in a jazz band at school, and as I got older, when I got into high school, I played in the local youth symphony orchestra. So I started playing um, drums in the band, and so I, I uh, then took lessons, and God love my parents, they bought me a drum set. <laughs> and I grew up in the Midwest, so they would put me in the basement, but my poor mother, it must have been so loud. So I would... <laughs> I would turn up my boombox, and in those days it was like poison, you know. And <laughs> yeah, yeah. Anyway, and Metallica, and I would play the drums, and also jazz. So I learned how to play drum set and timpani and all of the mallets, like um, marimbas and, and xylophone and all those mm -hmm, things, mm -hmm. and, um, and I loved it. So anytime I could make music with people, I really loved it. I would get really nervous by myself, like when I had a piano recital, mm -hmm. but I found when I was with a bunch of people making music, I was sort of like in the Zen space that I, I really loved. And so that's how it happened. And um, I never dreamed I would do this for a living. And when I went to college, I never intended to be a music major. Wonderful, wonderful. Bringing it back to uh, choral music and directing, can you explain exactly for our audience, what is choral music? That is like the million dollar question. <laughs> People ask me that all the time. Because I think choral music is any time two or more people are together mm -hmm. and they take a breath together and they sing. Um, I think that sometimes, you know, y you go to a, um, an event, maybe there's a protest and people are singing. To me, that's choral music. I think being in church and singing in like a congregation or being at a temple and singing, you know, in a synagogue choir or something, that's choral music. Um, I hear students together singing barbershop, you know, in, in, four in groups of four. I think <laughs> that's also choral music. To me, choral music is, is being together with people taking a breath and using your voice and listening at the same time that you're singing, which is different. You know, when you're, when you're singing solo repertoire, yeah, you're listening a little bit, um, but mostly you're thinking about being a soloist, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, when, and when you're singing with others, there is this really beautiful balance of listening and singing, of being sympathetic and empathetic with the person next to you, not singing louder than them, singing with them, you know? Mm -hmm. Help, sometimes helping them, sometimes leaning on them, you mm -hmm. know, depending. And so that I, that's what choral music is to me. Um, you know, it's not just my professional choir at Segerstrom Center. Like some of my favorite choral moments have happened not in a concert hall. I mean, I, I took the students to Australia this summer and um, in the University Singers. We toured all over Eastern and Southern um, Australia. Oh. And one of my very favorite moments we went into these caves. We, we, we took the students into these very, very old caves, and we were down miles below the Earth's surface, and we got into this big, beautiful cave, and the students looked at me and said, can we sing? And I said, let's do it. Yeah. And I don't want to conduct, and I asked my um, graduate student uh, at the time, her name was, is, was Sierra. She's now in England studying, but um, I invited her to conduct. And I'll tell you, that performance in this cave was almost more special than a performance in a concert hall, you know? I mean, 
being able to use your voice to bring people together, I think, is a really special thing. And, and to me, that's what choral music is. I think that's why I fell in love with it. That's wonderful. That's wonderful. Can you tell me a little bit more? In addition to teaching here at CSUF, you're also the artistic director, for, um, the artistic, excuse me, the artistic director of Pacific Choral at the Sagerstrom Center for the Arts. Can you tell me a little bit more about that? Definitely. So Pacific Choral is um, a professional choral organization. We're one of the highest budgeted choruses in the country, which just means that we have to raise a lot of money. <laughs> um, but we're a professional symphony chorus. We offer a series of performances at Segerstrom Center for the Arts and then also throughout Orange County. The chorus um, is as big sometimes as 160 people um, singing with a big orchestra and it's as small sometimes as 24 to 12 people depending on the repertoire. So um, on our roster we have probably about 280 singers that sing with us never at the same time because we produce so many different concerts. We also we sing with the Pacific Symphony and we sing with the Los Angeles Philharmonic Orchestra and then sometimes other orchestras and people that come into town. And so we um, staff these concerts um, and cast them with singers that are made up from the 280. Within that group there is um, a whole stable of professional singers, we call them staff singers, that we pay and they're employees of Pacific Chorale, as well as really highly skilled volunteer singers. The people that, um, are, that serve as volunteer singers go through this extensive audition process to sing with us. They're excellent musicians um, and they really enjoy sharing their gift with the community and with our organization. So Pacific Chorale is um, one of our nation's biggest um, choral organizations and I, I'm really happy and proud to lead it. We also have a really large education program um, so we reach out to people of all ages so we have programs for senior citizens, programs for obviously people older people like me, middle-aged people, and for children. We have in-school programs, um, and we even have some programs that we run concurrently with um, Cal State Fullerton. So um, it's, a, it's a busy job, and it's a lot of fun. I, um, I love the fact that I, I get to watch our students transition from singing here with me at Cal State Fullerton to singing sometimes professionally with me at Pacific Chorale, and, and that's really fun. We're a sister organization with Pacific Symphony, so we have totally different leadership, totally different budgets and everything else, but we perform together quite a bit. Oh, okay, perfect, like like a collaboration. Yeah, you would say, it, right? definitely. Yeah. I think we're some of the most collaborative of, of our, of our or kinds of organizations in the country. I'm very close with their music director, Carl St. Clair, and he and I work together to, to pick repertoire, and I love preparing my choir to sing for him oh, that's because wonderful. he's such a generous and loving person. And so, um, so it's a really, it's a wonderful position and I feel really blessed to, to be able to work in two such, two special places. Of course, wonderful. And I know you did um, collaborate with a team of conductors and chorus masters um, for the recording of Mahler Symphony 8, Symphony of a Thousand. <laughs> what was the process like for this piece? I need to know. <laughs> okay, it's a, first of all, it's a major undertaking. So Mahler 8 is probably the biggest piece of classical music that was ever written. Mm -hmm. They call it Symphony of a Thousand because when Gustav Mahler wrote the piece, the promoter was trying to get people to come out and he saw so many people on the stage. He's like, it's like there's a thousand people here. And so then <laughs> that's how they marketed it, Symphony of a Thousand. Normally, um, when they produce a uh, performance like this, it's made up of many, many different choirs. Sometimes they'll put together like 25, 30 different choirs with this gigantic orchestra. For this particular performance, um, my friend um, Gustavo Dudamel, who's the conductor at the Los Angeles Philharmonic, had a dream of producing a really, really superb performance of Mahler 8. You can imagine if you have like 30 choirs singing, all with different conductors, that it can be kind of messy. And so um, he invited um, my friend Grant Gershon, who's the, co he's the conductor at um, Los Angeles Master Chorale, and me, to each bring 100 of our very best singers. And so each of us prepared, so I taught my singers, 100 of them, this crazy piece of music, which is all in Latin and German. It's beautiful. For double choirs, yeah. I mean, it's insane. Yeah. And, then, um, and then my friends Luke and Fernando prepared their children's choruses. Likewise, there were two children's choruses that they prepared to sing all the stuff for children. And then they put us all in Disney Hall with the Los Angeles Philharmonic as big as it can get in there. Mm 
And in fact, the choir was so big because it was 200 adults and about 60 children, it was so big that we took over the seating that uh, typically is next to the organ in Disney Hall. So we took over the audience seating so we could fit up in there. Um, and because we were in such a beautiful hall and because we knew that we would prepare this so precisely, um, uh, the recording company Deutsche Grammophon, which is a really wonderful recording company, obviously based in Germany, they said, oh, we want to record this. We know this is going to be great. And they also said, we want this to be the very first performance recorded on Dolby Atmos, which I don't know if you know about Dolby Atmos. It is a brand new um, recording system mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that's like environmental recording. So they've oh, recorded, wow. like you can hear, um, like even the new John Legend album has been done in Atmos. And if you're wearing the right headphones, it's like surrounding you, the music wow. is. And you can hear things happening behind you and in front of you. It's, it's amazing. And so um, they put thousands and thousands of microphones in Disney Hall hanging from the ceiling. They looked like, they were like that big. They looked like little flying saucers. <laughs> and it was mapping the whole building. So they were capturing sound that was happening on stage, but also sound that was happening in the corners, the back corners of the hall, behind the organ, um, over the audience. And then somehow they had the technology then to take all of that recorded material to put together this, this very, very special recording. And if you listen to it on Atmos headphones, and of course Apple has them, you know, but if you listen to them on Atmos headphones, it sounds like you're, you are Gustavo Dudamel standing on the podium in Disney Hall with all of that music wrapped around you. It's gorgeous. That is, yeah. So they recorded the rehearsals and they recorded all of the performances. And we thought we were going to have to have what they call a patch session. So if somebody makes a mistake, then they'll, okay, sing these bars. Okay, we'll fix that and slap it in. But um, the people, the engineers and um, Maestro Dudamel and all of us said, you know what? I think the performances were really superb. Every night I was going home and listening to recordings. Of the, they were sending us the recordings so that I could give my choir tips, you know, the next day on how to make it even better. And they said, we don't have to have a patch session. It's going to be great. And that was the last we heard of it. Like it went away. I, I hadn't heard anything. <laughs> the pandemic happened and we thought, oh, well, I guess that's that. Maybe it's never going to come out. And then strangely in my email, I got this email in, in June of 2021 and they said, here's the recording. Crazy. And, <laughs> um, and I listened to it and I could not believe my ears. I was so proud of my choir and uh, my colleague Grant too. We called each other in tears that morning because we were so excited that it yeah. came out and we called each other and we were both crying and we said, I think this is the most beautiful recording we've ever heard of this piece. And, um, and we didn't care anything about awards. We were just so proud of our singers. And exactly. anyway, that's, that's how it happened. And it was, it was a lot of work to yes. put it together. And that's the best when something, you're not really expecting it and it happens. Right. Right? Yeah. That was, that was exciting. <laughs> it was crazy. Totally. And I know you, um, you won for the best choral performance at the 64th uh, Annual Grammys for Mahler Symphony 8, yeah. Symphony of a Thousand. And um, tell me a little bit more about that once in a lifetime experience, please. Well, the whole thing was surreal. I'll tell you, Dolores, I mean, I got, a, you know, we, I got the phone call, you've been nominated for a Grammy Award. And to me, that was, I was on cloud nine. And we were so excited, you know. And of course, I called Grant, and then we talked to Luke and Fernando. We're like, oh my gosh, we've been nominated not for orchestral performance, but for choral performance. That means they really liked our choirs. Wow, we were really <laughs> excited. And then we looked at all the people we were nominated against, and we're like, yeah, I don't know how we could possibly win this award. But we're so proud to be nominated. And um, they had it scheduled to take place in January of 2022, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And then the Omicron surge hit and they canceled the awards. Yes. And we thought, oh, well, that stinks. Oh, well, you know, that's the way it is. And then a few weeks later, we got an email saying, now they've been moved to Las Vegas mm -hmm. on April 3rd. And um, I looked at my partner, David, he goes, that's your birthday. April 3rd is my birthday. And I thought, oh, that's a good sign. Oh, that's my anniversary. And so it's your anniversary <laughs> yeah. too. Oh, see, April 3rd, it's a magical day. Yes. So um, we thought, well, that's a good omen. And uh, Grant and Luke and Fernando and I all talked to We said, let's go. Let's go to Las Vegas. And so we all did. And we stayed at Caesar's Palace and had a wonderful time, had some good meals because it was my birthday. And we were having so much fun. We thought, we don't even care if we win. <laughs> and so, um, so we showed up and, um, and they give out most of the awards at a ceremony before the televised awards that you mm -hmm. see. 
Now the televised awards are mostly performances. I don't know if you've watched recently, but it, yeah. there are very few awards. Mostly right. it's performances. So we were all in there, and I mean, stars galore. Like, you could not believe it. Like, Joni Mitchell walked right past me. Questlove was like right in front of me. I was dying over this whole thing. And we're sitting in the audience and enjoying ourselves and having a great time. Because, of course, they give you lots of wine, but then they don't give you a lot of food. So we were having a great time, you know. <laughs> so we're sitting there in the audience, and then um, they got to our, our category, and I got really nervous in my stomach. And for a moment, I thought, ooh, I'd really love to win. And then I just thought, you know, just be grateful that you're here. And then they called our names. And I, hardly, I could <laughs> hardly believe it. And um, we went up on stage. We had decided my friend Grant would give the speech. He's like the elder statesman. He's been in the business for a very long time, and he's one of my, you know, mentors. And so, he gave, he, you know, he gave our, our gratitude um, in the moment in the telecast. And then they whisk you off stage, and I didn't realize this. Like we left our, our I left my partner, and everybody left their wives in the audience, right? <laughs> and they take you off stage, and you're gone for like two hours. And you go to all this media, and they're taking mm -hmm. pictures of you and asking you questions. And nobody knows what a choir director does, you know. <laughs> so they they're asking you weird questions, but it was really fun, and we we had a really good time. The four of us together, and you're in this little golf cart going all over. And then all of a sudden, boom! They spit you out onto the red carpet, <laughs> <laughs> and you're standing there with with like really like A-list celebrities. And um, I couldn't find my partner, and we're texting back and forth, <laughs> and we did find each other. But my favorite. This is a funny story. I'll tell you a funny story. So I'm on the red carpet with Grant, my friend, and we're trying to find our people. And we're wandering around, bumping into celebrities, because I'm a big nerd, you know. And I don't know some of these people, which also my students tease me about. And I, all of a sudden, I looked over, and there was a man standing there in this all-white outfit with all these pearls all over it. And the pearls were falling off onto the red carpet. And I was like, oh, dear. And I saw a woman was going to step on it, and I stopped her, and I bent down, and I picked up the pearls, and I tapped the man and said, Sir, I'm so sorry, um, but you're losing your pearls. <laughs> He's like, I think I'm losing my marbles. And we both laughed, and we talked for a moment, and I didn't know who he was. And so we're laughing and talking, and he asked me what, you know, what we were there for, and he was telling me, Oh, I'm nominated for all these awards. And I was like, Oh, well, that's really cool, you know, awesome. And we left, and he said, Have a great time, have a great time. And Walked and had all the pictures and everything, and I was telling my partner, David, I'm like, oh, yeah, I ran to this guy. He's really nice, all these pearls. And he's like, that was Lil Nas X. And I said, oh, really? I just talked for like 10 minutes to Lil Nas X. I didn't ask, I didn't know who he was. <laughs> we had the best time, but I helped him pick up his pearls. So, How cute. so there you go. That was my favorite story of, of the whole night. And then, you know, to go to the big ceremony and hang out. And they put all the classical people in one section in the MGM Grand. And so that was really fun to be with colleagues from all over the world and to network and enjoy each other's company and toast. and Yes, that's wonderful. And we set up really late that night. Oh, yeah. That was fun. <laughs> that's great. And moving forward, just to wrap up a little bit, yeah. what um, are your future plans? And do you have any motivating words to our audience or students here? <laughs> well, my future plans are, are to, keep, to keep pushing myself to be the best I can be for everybody in my life. Um, I think that mu that being a musician is like um, living the, the Buddhist lifestyle of enlightenment. And that the older you get, the more experience you get, the more you open yourself up to music's possibilities, and the more you gain understanding and you become more adept at what you're doing. So I have lots of ideas. Um, I have a PBS special that came out last year. Um, we have a, I'm doing some staging. I really love staging. So I'm doing some more staged works with my choirs, not just here, but with Pacific Chorale. Mm -hmm. And so I have lots of dreams, um, travel dreams and um, recordings. I've got some recordings that I really want to do next. I'm excited about, about those possibilities. And then um, what I would say to you, Dolores, and to the students is that um, you're far more capable than you think you are. You have so much power inside of you and love you have so much life and passion to give to others that, that I think that the more you can tap into who you are in your authentic, vulnerable self, to be yourself and to give yourself freely to make this world a better place, you won't work a day in your life. You'll be living your dream in your passion and, and 
and really making the world into the vision of, of connected unity that we all believe in. Thank you for uh, joining us to discuss the world of choral studies and music. And I want to thank you, Dr. Eistad, for sharing your insight on this topic. Congratulations on your Grammy win. <laughs> and until next time, I'm Dolores Alvarez. This has been In Focus.